have your Bibles, you can turn to Genesis chapter 3. I said last week I was going to try to coordinate the teaching through John with the time of year we find ourselves in approaching Easter or Resurrection Day. And I looked at my calendar and I thought, wow, that's only two sermons away and we have four weeks. So I also recognize that I was a little, uh, little heavy last week, maybe a lot of information. And so I just decided, I thought, let's, let's camp here on the idea, the rhetorical question that Pilate asked before the one who said he was the way and the truth and the life. Truth incarnate, Pilate says, what is truth? So today we're going to look more at how this idea of truth that is captured and held captive much of our world today, how it has effects on, on the world. There's a, you know, with the, with the internet, there's so many different blogs and people can kind of put themselves forward as being, oh, I'm a teacher in such and such capacity. There's one, her name is Jory Micah. Have you ever heard of this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Actually, she has an MA in Christian doctrine and church history. She is more educated than I am. She may even be smarter than me. But she recently posted this, quote, I've spent my whole life studying the Bible, which I believe has made me a wise person. And yet the Bible is not my final authority anymore because I'm wise enough now to understand that I could be interpreting it wrong. What I trust now is my own internal guidance system. Okay. To which an astute observer paraphrased. In other words, I don't trust the Bible anymore because my thinking could be wrong, so now I trust my thinking. Okay, that's funny and sad, especially in light of the fact that she's following in the footsteps of other postmodern young women who desire to be leaders in the church. Her blog is called Breaking the Glass Steeple. <laughs> but what is most telling is her own self-doubt. Actually, it's arrogance masquerading as self-doubt as to her own ability to think and process information. Now, I don't believe any of it. It's easy to claim humility when it comes to knowing what the Bible teaches and then arrogantly assert that you can't know what the Bible teaches. She, she refutes what she posited with her next statement, but now I trust me. It's the, it's the polar opposite of what we used to be told when I grew up in church, so... You heard this, the Bible says it, I believe it, that, oh, see, we all, we all have the same Sunday school teacher, Miss Rash. So as I said, last week I covered a lot of material pretty quickly, and I don't want to just skip and skim over it. It's still directly relevant and related to the question of what is truth. And as a pastor, I want to make sure and take the time to equip you, God's people, so that when these storms and waves and, as Brother Vukovic said, it's, it's satanic doubts and unbelief come crashing into your house of faith, you're able to take your stand firmly on the rock that is the fountain of all truth and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. So quick review, John in his gospel has made reference to the concept of truth, of aletheia, that's the Greek word for truth, 26 times. He identifies all three persons of the Trinity with truth. In addition, he identifies the message of the gospel with truth. The word of God is truth. The righteous practices of the followers of Jesus is also referenced as truth. And even the mission of Jesus in his incarnation, death, and resurrection is spoken of as truth, and of course, the Lord Jesus himself. The way that we define truth must be in accordance with God's revelation and according to the categories of truth that God has given us. We only know that from his word. Francis Schaeffer said, in the very 
first sentence of his book that became part of the Francis Schaeffer trilogy, The God Who Is There, Escape From Reason, and He Is There and He Is Not Silent. The very first sentence is this. The present chasm between the generations has been brought about almost entirely by a change in the concept of truth. Radical. It's a radical idea that one idea, if it is true, then the opposite of that idea would be false. As the fancy word is antithesis or anti-idea. But the, the point is that when Jesus says that you're either for me or against me, he's using the terms that God expects his people to use and by extension, everyone else in the world. Remember, everyone is accountable to God to obey his law. And so when God speaks in these kind of antithetical terms, then that's what we embrace as his people, as the logical categories that God has given us. Truth is not subjective to your own perception. Truth is not relative to you or to me. It doesn't depend on anyone's personal experience or perspective. In fact, it is absolute and fixed. It is objective. You can taste and see and look at it and test it. And it can be taught and understood and explained and verified and communicated. So I want to explain very quickly where we are in the timeline of human history. We talked about you know, going through the Bible in a year and teaching it in two. Well, I'm going to explain human history in three sentences. How's that? <clears throat> and this is on the back of your bulletin if you want to follow along. And I'm, getting, I'm taking this from Phil Johnson. He, he taught on this subject quite a bit. <clears throat> and then we'll dive into Genesis 3. Where we are as a, as a society in Western civilization, there are basically three eras of human history that we can look to and understand how we understand the nature of truth. First, we have the pre-modern period. That would be the vast majority of, of human history from the very beginning up until about the Enlightenment period in the 1700s. All of humanity, with just few exceptions, believe that truth is absolute and it's fixed and it's not just for you, it's for everyone. And it is governed in large part by supernatural forces. That was a big component to the pre-modern world. That includes Christianity. We believe that the, govern, the world is governed by supernatural forces, right? But the word of God, he sustains and breathes life. He created it. It's his, his world, his categories, his law. But the pagans also believed that the world was governed by supernatural forces. They could be animistic, you know, the tree demons and the street demons or whatever. It could be some kind of Greek ideal, the, the, the demonic one or whatever, but they still looked outside of what we could see and touch and taste and feel as being the mover of the universe. The Greeks would call it, you know, well, fate has decreed. Well, what's fate? Well, fate is really nothing but pure blind will. But that's how people thought up until a certain time period. Then we come to the modern era. I, I always think of the old Terry Gilliam film, the Adventures of Baron Munchausen, where his idea of modernity was all gears and clocks and everything's working, kind of like the deistic God. He, he wound up the universe and now everything works according to plan. Truth is still absolute, by the way. Truth is still objective in this universe, but there's no connection whatsoever to anything that we would call supernatural. The Enlightenment brought us rationalism, which was that we can know what we know just by what we come up with in our own minds as it comports generally with reality or empirical science. We'll do experiments and we'll, we'll see, we'll observe. What, we, what, can, what can we observe that is real and that's truth? Now, universal absolutes divorced from God gave us the 20th century. When I say the 20th century, What's the first thing you think of? Anyone? Hitler. 
Not a nice guy. What about Stalin and Pol Pot and all of these tyrants that within a hundred year period killed more people by war and by their own governments than all of human history combined. So you can have absolute objective standards, but if they're not rooted in God, it beats itself to death and creates, yes, death, destruction, ugliness, not a good thing. Right. So someone would look at that situation and say, well, we don't want that, but I don't really like God. So they came up with these other categories that we call postmodern, which means after the modern period. The dominant idea there in secular minds today is that even if truth exists somewhere, we can't know it for sure. We can't know what truth is. Nobody can know what truth is for sure. And our entire society is beginning to embrace this idea that ultimate reality doesn't really exist anymore. It doesn't matter much even if it did because you couldn't know it. It's still down to preference and then ultimately raw power. Now, how does a Christian consider that kind of view of truth and then the claims made by God in his word? Can they go together? Well, no. It, it's antithetical. It's, it's the opposite. And the thing is, the challenges to God's word don't take modern and postmodern categories. It's been going on since the very beginning. If you have your Bibles, let's look at Genesis chapter 3. See, God's categories of truth have, are as ancient as we can see, can measure, ever since man has been on the scene. So no, up to this point, <clears throat> God has told us how he created the world, that is, by the word of his power. Six days he created it, and it was all very good. It was literally paradise. Adam had work to do. When God gave him a wife, his first response was, let's sing a song. This is awesome. Finally. Genesis 3, 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but, not, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And we're going to stop there. In the Garden of Eden, again, paradise. The, the labor that you did did not meet resistance. We find later in chapter 3 that thorns and thistles would block the way to your labor and now you're going to sweat and toil and be grumpy and want to kick the cat when you get home. It was good. Fruitful and multiply. 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, and on. Multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion. But that was man. And here's Satan, the fallen angel in the form of a serpent, challenging everything. In the garden, God's covenant stipulations were absolute, objective, and knowable. As with anything God has spoken, these commands are reflective of God's own character, and they are as true as God himself is true. The temptation of Eve was in one sense an attack on the concept of truth as truth, an attack on God's revelation. How? Well, okay. First, it questioned the very words that God had spoken to Adam and Eve. Has God said? All the wickedness comes from half, God said. And Satan did this in a way by questioning the woman's perception or interpretation. Has he really said? Is that what he really said? Are you sure? 
He cast suspicion on what she had heard as the words of God, the content of God's revelation. Has God said is the ancient and satanic call to question your own relationship with God and your worldview. What is real? What is not? What is true? What is false? What is good? What is bad? It begins here at least with saying, really? Are you sure? Are you sure? Has he said? As Matthew Henry says, that is the subtlety of Satan to blemish the reputation of the divine law as uncertain or unreasonable. And so to draw people to sin, that is therefore, that it is therefore our wisdom to keep up a firm belief of and high respect for the law of God. So first, questioning the words. Second, it outright contradicted what was patently obvious and clear. God had said, in the day you eat of it, you will surely die. And this attack, once you've established that your perception could be wrong, says, no, 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 that's, that's not true. You surely will not die. It's the antithesis of the word of God. The audacity is amazing, but it really is the next step in undermining the truth. She knows what she heard, but here is the opposite, and she's already unsure of her footing on her own interpretive ability and how to... Am I sure about this? It starts to make sense. As soon as there is any consideration of falsehood or error in God or in what he speaks, it's downhill all the way. Doubt comes first and it leads to unbelief. How many of you know people who you were sitting next to, worshiping with, taking the Lord's Supper with, and they're not with Jesus anymore? I, I, they're in my head. I'm, I'm not going to name them. always starts with, I'm not really sure that's what the Bible says. So an attack that is a direct contradiction. Third and finally, this attack on truth, on God's truth, it impugns God's motives for the commands. For God knows in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. Wow, flattery will get you everywhere. In other words, the serpent says that God wants to keep them in the dark in blind ignorance, as it were, and from their full potential. You could be like God. You could have the authority to make your own morality. And as John Gill writes, this agrees with what is ironically said in Genesis 3.22. Behold, the man has become as one of us, as the devil told him he should, and he believed that this bait laid for him suited to the intellectual mind and to the ambitious desires to be like God, not being content with finite knowledge, in other words, what God has told them, but aiming at omniscience or something like it. And now the temptation began to take place and operate. So much, much more could be said on this passage. But the analogy I want to make here is this, that the current cultural spirit of the age, the German word zeitgeist, we use that for how everyone's thinking, regarding truth and knowledge is something we just take for granted, some people do anyway, has much more in common with the tactics of the devil in the temptation of Eve than it does with any of the categories of truth that God has given us. Throughout the vast majority of human history, this is how people thought, now it's not. What is truth? Well, I'll, I'll review from the last week. Truth is that which reflects the world that God has made. It is that which is a beautiful unity and in agreement with the knowledge of God himself and is in harmony with God's revelation and his word. And right from the very beginning of the entrance of sin and death in the world, this concept of truth was questioned, it was lied about, and held in scorn as something that will keep humanity from reaching our potential. Well, we know the outcome. As a result of falling into this temptation of unbelief and rebellion, Adam 
who hearkened unto the voice of his wife, disobeyed and plunged all of his offspring into sin and misery and death. We know God would have been fair and just to immediately and permanently judge mankind. But in his kindness, he sent his son as a substitute for sinners. Truth incarnate, Jesus said. He came into a broken world, a world of lies and deceit and death, and he took the punishment that we had coming to us so that we would glorify God and live lives of truth and beauty and goodness. If you don't know Christ today, I want to challenge you. Repent of your sins. Turn to him in saving faith. He is the only way to the Father. Leaving a life of sin, asking him to forgive you, and setting him as king of your life. Well, the enemy of life and all that is true hates all of this, and he will stop at nothing to undermine God's work. And as we know, the, the enemy of our souls is clever. And like Jory Micah is smarter than me, he's smarter than you. He has a degree to prove it. For the Christians living in the 19th and most of the 20th century, that middle category was the enemy to true faith. If you know about J. Gresham Mason and his book, Christianity and Liberalism, He's not, he's not fighting against postmodern subjective thought. He's fighting against modern objective thought that is godless. Modernism was the enemy, and rightly so. Most of the big mainline liberal denominations today got to their sorry state by embracing modernism and rejecting the supernatural so that they could relate to the surrounding culture around them. The idea that they thought wrongly, of course, that they would be irrelevant to modern man if they kept talking about things like the virgin birth and six-day creationism and talking snakes and talking donkeys and universal floods. And of course, science had refuted all that. Well, we know science has spoken, right? But no longer, that's not the case anymore. We're not fighting anti-supernaturalism. We're fighting concepts of truth that say you can't know anything for sure. Science is now thrown by the wayside. For the last year, what did you hear about masks? Believe the science. It's settled. Science is never settled. Did you know that? True science, that which can be known and tested and repeated and observed, sure. But when it's a challenge to your subjective, lustful desires, it's thrown aside just like the Bible. What do I mean by that? Let me give you a couple examples. Somebody said that they didn't follow me last week until I started talking about 69 Camaros. That made sense, so, okay. By the way, can we all agree it is a cool car? All right, case in point. We can prove beyond any reasonable doubt that a baby in mommy's womb is a fully functional individual with his or her own DNA and is exactly what every single full human person is at that particular stage of development. You were once that. I was once that. By the way, Adam and Eve figured this out without an owner's manual. Nine months later, wow, what in the world? Oh, a baby. Everyone knows this. This is science because true science comports with God's word. We know this. We can know this for sure and certain. We're going to talk more about certainty next week. But just to know, it's, it's baked in. <clears throat> Science. It's objective and measurable and repeatable. But no. Because of sin and subjective personal application of truth, that baby is only as valuable as the individual mother decides 
the baby is valuable. It's all subjective. Laws on the books where there's a willful car accident and a baby, a mother and her baby perish. It's double homicide. What if the lady was driving to Planned Parenthood and killed the baby herself? Then it's just an abortion. It's insane. It literally is irrational. It does not comport with reality. This extends all the way to your identity as a man or a woman, boy or girl. Just past the house, you're probably tired of hearing me say it, the Equality Act is something we gotta look out for. It's wicked. Whatever gains were made in the Civil Rights Act of 1964 as it outlawed, rightly outlawed discrimination based on color or race or ethnicity or sex, you can test that, by the way. There's a marker for that. It's called chromosomes and DNA. and It's all science. You can, you can use DNA to test for your ethnicity and your background. You test my DNA and I'm gonna be from Central Europe and you know, as, as we say, we're, America took the, the dregs of European society and turned them into Americans. Well, yay. And you can use chromosomes, X, XX, you're a woman, XY, you're a man. That's science, that's objective, repeatable, observable. But no, because of sin and this idea of truth as subjective to your own head and anyone else's, now anyone who claims to feel a certain way can sue you to the poverty house because you won't hire them because you know they're not what they say they are. In other words, men claiming to be women, women claiming to be men, men acting like women, women acting like men. I'm sorry, the Bible says you can't do that. I'm sorry, but the Civil Rights Act of 64 now says you gotta hire me. But it's crazy, right? Isn't that insane? This isn't our father's society anymore. In fact, you could even say that this whole schema, our society, is a classic example of what Paul said about the society in Ephesus in 2 Timothy chapter 3. What does he say? They're always learning, but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. I remember for years, I was considered cool by some of my friends because I kept an open mind. As soon as I converted to Christ, I'm not cool anymore. Why? I, I kept an open mind and I'm deciding that this is true. That's not me deciding, but you know the idea. Postmodern philosophers are those people who, where they want to make it just about your personal perspective are always learning. They can get more degrees on the walls, more letters, and yet never arrive at the truth. G.K. Chesterton said that an open mind is like an open mouth. It's intended to eventually close on something. A good friend of mine one time agreed to enter into an email debate with a young man who was confused about these things. He, he described himself as an agnostic. In other words, when it comes to whether or not God exists or whether there's truth, he would say, I don't know. The very first introductory email my friend made what many people would consider to be an arrogant and outrageous claim. He wrote this, I know you think that you have reason on your side, but I predict, he's like going out on a limb here, I'm not a prophet or the son of a prophet, but I predict that eventually within this debate, you're gonna abandon reason and appeal to some sort of irrationality. In other words, he predicted that this young man would have to abandon his idea about truth and embrace some kind of subjective, personal, illogical thing. How, could, how can you say that? Remember, for, for hundreds of years almost, at least the last 250 years of Western Civ, the claim has always been made. You have faith, I have reason. You have the Bible, I have facts. That's the modernist. 
This claim has been made that the Christian has to park his brain at the door and just believe. For the rationalist, for a skeptical person even, you Christians have faith. We have reason. But see, we know better than that. My friend wasn't just going to present a, a bunch of facts to this young man. Here's more evidence. He knew that according to God's revelation, that this young man already knew the truth that God existed. But what was he doing with that knowledge? Suppression. Catacho. He's, he's pushing that beach ball under the water, trying to hold it there. And it was only a matter of time, and this actually happened, I read the email, where the young man could no longer defend his skepticism and ignorance while at the same time acknowledging some kind of absolute standard. <laughs> and he devolved into, well, maybe in some universes, logic isn't the law. <laughs> I mean, it, it was there. He was right. This is the world that God has made, and we must live in this world. Schaefer called it a, a grace to be shut up in reality. What did he mean by that? Well, to know what's true and to know what's objective and according to God's revelation means then that you can live your life apart from sin and be fulfilled and have meaning and purpose as a human being. It's awesome. Even though, yes, bad things happen and come across our paths. What does the old hymn say? He does, he does that for your, for your good, for your growth. We can't make our own reality. Can you imagine a four-year-old's version of reality becoming real? Well, we've got just a few minutes left. And as, as in the lie that the serpent told to Eve, we can't make our own right and wrong. Listen, if you do a word search on any Bible software for the word truth, you will be blown away by how often it comes up. This is central, key. Psalm 31.5 says, You've ransomed me, O God, O Lord God of truth. Isaiah 65.16 Because he who is blessed in the earth will be blessed by the God of truth. I want to bring us down to a current situation that I know many of us are aware of. I brought some objects with me today. I have never done this, but I just want the visitors to know this is not normal. Um, I was going to wear skinny jeans and quote movies all day, but I better start. I'm going to start with objects, right? I'm, I'm kidding. All right. Anybody re recognize this book? A Shattered Visage. Who is it by? Ravi Zacharias. Right. It's a wonderful book. I, I learned a lot from it. Oh, wait, there's more. Ooh, even, even bigger. Deliver Us from Evil. Ravi, Ze Ravi Zacharias. Look at that. We've got the DVD here. It says Tim and Heidi Bushong on it. It's mine. Got the book with the famous Edvard Munch painting on the front. Got the study guide. Deliver us from evil. What has just happened to a man who spent his career teaching on the nature of truth? We've got to look at this situation and go, yeah. This is, this is hitting hard. If you don't know, it's come out in the wash since the man died that he was involved in some not good practices. It's sexual in nature. I learned a lot from him. I, I couldn't find my old original three cassette Veritas form. You probably know where they are. I didn't ask. It, it introduced me to a, a way of thinking. At the time, I was reading Schaefer, and C.S. Lewis, I found out Schaefer is Kuiper for dummies, I was coming to some of my worldview conclusions, and there's Rafi Zacharias teaching, teaching about the 
either or antithesis view of truth. His famous story of having dinner with a man who insisted that he either use a both and method of reasoning or nothing at all. You all know the story where the food gets congealed and cold and he spent the whole time arguing actually that supported Ravi's conclusion. How this thinking isn't Western, even Indian philosophers thought in terms of either or. And yet, what's missing? Listen, one of the main issues, and we just sang about it in a paraphrased way. Psalm 51, we know, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. And you can teach analytically about truth all day long. But if truth doesn't get down deep into your very soul, then what, what, what good is it? The very next verse, Psalm 51, 6. Behold, you desire truth in my inmost parts or my innermost being. And in the hidden part, you will, you will make known wisdom. As, as much as I benefited from Ravi, it breaks my heart that he was willing to not let truth rule in his inmost being. Well, the next verse, purify me with hyssop and I will be clean. That's speaking of the old covenant sacrifice. Wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. I mean, yeah, we can, we can look at the situation and, you know, when you've got a ministry with not just seven figure budget, but eight, and you have access to lots of money and you spend months away from home and you're not in your local fellowship, it's, it's the danger of Christian apologetics ministries. You're not in the local church. You're not, you're not hearing God's truth week in, week out, being applied. And I admired the man for the way he would approach people that were antagonistic, that hated God. And instead of me with my claymore, you know, brave heart, he was more subtle with the rapier. And he'd have them eviscerated and they said, well, I, I don't feel anything yet and he's a nice guy. And then their whole position fall apart. I appreciate that. I appreciate that he was kind and winsome and yet never compromised on what the Bible taught and yet in his own life. Somehow there was a disconnect. I can't, ex I can't explain it. I don't know. But I'll leave us with this today. The world can think crazy, cray-cray. Our government can legislate literally insane, irrational, does not add up laws. They can do it all day long and, and frankly, we may have to pay the penalty for standing against such craziness. But the only reason we know it's crazy is because we're Christians. We know this, we can stand upon the word of God but even as we do that, we must make sure, my friends, my brothers and sisters, we can't remain in the realm of just standing firm and being analytically true if we don't have truth in our inmost parts. This means that we take what God says and we, we don't attempt to muzzle anything in the word. That we let the word wash over us as an old friend of mine said, when I, when I read the Bible, it's, it's, I'm the one being read. It's reading me to the very core. That's what Hebrews 4.12 is about. Living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It penetrates to dividing. What is it, what's the point there? That the word of God, as it, as it is truth in the inmost parts, gets to the very core of who you are as a human being created in the image of God, who you are as a believer in Christ. And just as a living and active sword does as the surgeon's scalpel, it skillfully, by the Spirit of God, cuts away that part of you that must be done away with or you die. And it leaves the healthy, living, vibrant you. Truth is absolute and objective and fixed and knowable and communicable. 
communicable, all of those things. But we must have truth in our hearts and live according to that truth and be changed by that truth. Amen. All right, let's pray. Lord, we are indeed grateful to you for your truth. We're so thankful that you didn't leave us in a sea of skepticism and subjectivism. Again, as Paul wrote, you you were so merciful to not leave us darkened in our understanding and in the futility of our thinking and enslaved by passions. Now, Lord, help us as your people to indeed not only know your truth, to study your truth and be thankful for your truth, but that we would internalize your truth and live your truth so that the works we do would be seen by even your enemies and they would still give praise to our Father in heaven. Help us, Lord. Give us strength and courage in these days to stand for truth and to be changed by your truth. And we ask all this for your glory. In the name of Christ, amen.